Today here at Prima Temp, we're excited to have Dr. Clarissa Gracia. Dr. Gracia is Chief of Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility at Penn Fertility Care. Uh, thank you for joining us here today, Dr. Gracia. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So my first question we have for you is, when do you advise women to start taking a fertility drug? So generally we advise women with a diagnosis of infertility um, to you know, seek an evaluation, kind of figure out what's happening and then pursue a treatment that will address the particular problem that a woman is having. So typically we define infertility as a year of unprotected intercourse without conceiving. Um, and we start the evaluation typically at that time in women less than 35, but in women who are over 35, because age is an issue for women as they get older, it becomes more difficult to get pregnant. We usually start the treatment at, at the evaluation after about six months. And that evaluation typically involves an assessment of the uterus and the fallopian tubes to see if they're open, um, an assessment of the sperm quality, and also we kind of um, look to see if a woman is having regular menstrual cycles and ovulating every month. And then once we have all of that information, we can figure out the best strategy for treating her. I know that this uh, follow-up questionnaire um, obviously will be based on the individual infertility diagnosis but what is in general the most common fertility drug? So probably the most common fertility drug that's prescribed in the United States is clomiphene citrate. Mm -hmm. So that is a pill that a woman takes five days out of the month, um, typically between days four and five of the menstrual cycle for five days. And basically what it does is it it's an estrogen antagonist. So it essentially causes the pituitary gland to secrete more follicle stimulating hormone, which is the hormone that stimulates the growth of the eggs in the ovaries. So for a woman who's not ovulating regularly, it can help induce ovulation. And for women who are already ovulating every month, it can increase the number of eggs released per month. So kind of upping the odds that pregnancy will happen. I imagine if it, in, you know, if it's increasing the number of eggs, then there's an increased chance of multiples. One of the side effects um, is that it does increase the risk of multiple pregnancy. However, medications like clomiphene citrate, generally, you know, 90% of the babies born are single births. There's about a 10% chance of multiples. It's pretty rare to have anything more than twins, but it's definitely a risk. The media can make it seem like having more than multiples is common, but it's reassuring to hear that it's rare. <laughs> Who is the best candidate to take Clomid? So the best, the, the best um, patients um, to treat with Clomid are women who are either not ovulating regularly, um, typically women who don't get periods every month, those are women who might not be ovulating every month, um, or women who are ovulating and who have what we call unexplained infertility, so the tubes are open, there's good quality sperm, um, but we can't figure out a reason for the fertility problem, and simply increasing the number of eggs released per month can kind of increase the odds. Often in those patients, we combine Clomid, clomiphene citrate treatment with intrauterine insemination, where we actually take the sperm, we concentrate it, and put it into the uterus at the time a woman is ovulating. So not only do we have potentially more eggs, but we also potentially have more sperm at the right place, the right time, which increases the odds of pregnancy. When you combine Clomid plus IUI, how successful is it on average? So in a, in a couple less than 40 with a woman less than 40 years of age who does clomiphene citrate plus intrauterine insemination typically the success is about eight percent per month it sounds very low but in a couple who's been trying to get pregnant for at least a year the odds of them getting pregnant on their own often is as low as two to three percent so it does increase the odds yeah. clomid alone doesn't work quite as well as the combination may increase the odds slightly to, you know, four to six percent or something in that population. But the success really depends on, you know, your age and exactly what's happening with your fertility diagnosis. 
Uh, thanks for sharing those statistics. Those are not easy to find online, and I think they can really help um, make an informed decision or manage expectations. Um, you know, this sounds like a pretty powerful drug. What are the side effects, and um, are there any that women should be worried about? So some of the side effects of clomiphene citrate include hot flashes, night sweats. Some people get some mood changes. Um, you know, some bloating, and you might have a little bit more discomfort with ovulation because you have more than one egg and your ovaries might get a little larger um, mm -hmm. because the eggs live within follicles in your ovaries. And sometimes women can feel that a little bit, but generally they're pretty mild symptoms and it's well tolerated. And with a combination of treatments, are there any additional risks? The combination with the insemination, I mean, theoretically, you can have, you know, infection and things like that from insemination, but it's very, very, I personally, I've never seen an infection from an insemination, yeah. so it's extremely rare. Um, so generally, it's mostly the medication that causes, causes kind of the side effects. And then again, the biggest issue that you did bring up is the risk of multiple pregnancy. Okay. Um, you know, ideally, a woman gets pregnant with one baby at a time because twins do uh, pose a higher risk to a woman and the baby. Um, in pregnancy. For women who Clomid is not working for, um, what are the alternatives? Right, so other medications like Clomid include a medicine called letrozole, which is an aromatase inhibitor. It basically makes, um, you know, makes your body produce less estrogen, again, in the same way, then causes a higher um, kind of stimulation production of follicle stimulating hormone that then increases the odds of ovulation and also can be used um, to increase the number of eggs ovulated per month, very similar to clomiphene. So that's probably another drug that's very commonly used. Um, it seems to work a little better in women who don't ovulate regularly, like women with polycystic ovary syndrome. So we tend to use that in those women to induce ovulation more than clomiphene, I would say. Um, other medications that can be given uh, include, you can actually give follicle stimulating hormone itself. Typically it has to be given in the form of an injection and either it's recombinant follicle stimulating hormone or highly purified urinary follicle stimulating hormone. Um, and that directly uh, influences the ovary to produce more eggs. Um, but it has a higher risk of multiple pregnancy, actually closer to 25% oh, wow. when used in combination with intrauterine insemination. So actually, we use that medication much less um, because it is a little bit riskier. Yeah. That medicine is mostly used for women who are doing in vitro fertilization. So in, in in vitro fertilization, what we're doing is we're stimulating the growth of multiple eggs um, in the ovaries, so anywhere from, you know, five to 30 eggs potentially within a menstrual cycle. Um, and then we're going in and actually retrieving the eggs using a minor surgical procedure and then fertilizing the eggs in the laboratory and then have embryos created and, and then transferring an embryo into the uterus. And so for women who uh, want to avoid multiple pregnancy, we can select, for example, a single embryo to transfer, and that, that does reduce that risk of multiple pregnancy. Yeah, it really must not be an easy decision, you know, to start with, you know, drugs and IUI or go straight to IVF, um, especially if you're having to balance the risk of having to do it again, right? Yeah. Yes. I mean, IVF is the most successful treatment we have, so it definitely works the best, but it is a lot for a woman to go through and it's expensive. Many insurances, yeah. you know, doesn't cover it. So, you know, it is, um, you know, it's a challenge for couples to make these decisions sometimes. Do you guide couples in making that decision? I mean, I imagine it's based on age and their infertility diagnosis. You know, what would you say is the first step? Is that too dependent on an individual or is there a step before IVF in general? So there is um, kind of a general approach that we take. The first step definitely is doing the workup and figuring out what the cause of infertility is. If the sperm count is extremely low or the tubes are blocked, we may actually go straight to IVF because no matter how much medication you give, if your tubes are blocked, for example, or you don't have you know, enough sperm, it's not gonna work. Um, but in other cases where we do have open tubes and there is good quality sperm, we typically start with medications like Clomid or Letrozole, typically around three 
six cycles of clomiphene with intrauterine insemination. And then after that, if that doesn't work, we move to IVF. Now, when women are 38 or older, there's some evidence to suggest that IVF works better and faster for women. And so in those patients, we, we often talk, talk about doing IVF as a first step. But again, sometimes there are restrictions, you know, depending on what a patient wants to do or depending on what her insurance can cover. Right. Um, and so those are things to think about. At what age would you stop recommending fertility treatment? You know, we're waiting so much longer to have children and 38 feels like the new 28 and um, to many of us. Um, but is there a time to stop fertility treatment? There are lots of women who are, you know, coming at waiting, you know, it takes a while to meet the man of your dreams for sure. And sometimes people never do meet the man of their dreams. But um, I think that definitely, you know, women want to pursue their careers and there are lots of opportunities now for women and it's great so some women are seeing us for freezing their eggs and talking about these options which of course it's a good idea to always be proactive and think about your fertility um, the problem is that fertility does decline as a woman gets older it goes down after 35 goes down even more after 40 and by 45 it's extremely rare for a woman to get pregnant on her own even with fertility treatments IVF, et cetera. It just does not work well. Generally over 42, it's, it, you know, the success of fertility treatments are very low. Right. What can work for very older women um, is you can use an, an egg from another woman, a young woman, that's called donor egg, with um, your partner's sperm, create an embryo and carry the pregnancy. But obviously most, most individuals want to have their own genetic child if they can. Right. So that's, that's something that some women pursue if their own fertility options are limited, I would say.